My name is Tomris Lafley. I'm a film critic for Variety and RogerEbert.com and a member of New York Film Critics Circle. I am so honored to moderate today's conversation for 92Y Talks with uh, Paolo Sorrentino. Hello, Paolo. Hello, hello, thank you. <laughs> um, we are here to, of course, discuss The Hand of God um, from Netflix, nominated this year for an Academy Award and the Best International Feature category. Also a winner at Venice, the Silver Lion Prize. It has been celebrated throughout the festival season, continued its journey in Telluride, where I first had the honor of seeing this wonderful movie. Um, so I'm just so excited to be joined here by you. So let's start there. Let's start with um, the celebration of this movie. You're nominated for an Academy Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nearly a decade after give or take the great beauty one in the same category, it feels like a different world, a different time right now. So I'm just wondering what it feels like for you to be back in the awards conversation in such a big way. Oh, for me, it's a, it's a big honor and it's a great thing uh, being, nominated, being nominated uh, for the second time. It's um, an unbelievable thing. It does not happen so often. So I am uh, very, very happy and uh, I, I, I have many emotions. Then I, I am very happy to be here in LA. I love to stay here. So um, for me, it's a wonderful thing to, to, to be here. Yeah. This is a very personal film for you, perhaps the most personal film you've made to date, nearly three decades into your career. So a two-part question there, what made you feel compelled to share this deeply personal story with the world? And how did you decide this was the right time to do so? Uh, it's, it's, it's always uh, difficult to, uh, to answer uh, uh, about uh, why it's uh, the right time. It's something uh, not so easy to, to describe. Um, at a certain point, uh, a movie, it's like a movie ask uh, to you to, to be done. Uh, it becomes a sort of um, fre frequent uh, thought, uh, something that um, you think all the time, and the only chance that you have in order to be liberated by this uh, thought is uh, to make the movie. I don't know, maybe when, when I turned on 50, I thought it was the right moment to look uh, back uh, at my pain. It was years uh, that I was thinking about this movie, but uh, I never found uh, uh, not the, the courage, but maybe the, the strength the, um, to, to face uh, that kind of movie. Because it, it's not only a personal private movie, but it's also a movie very different from uh, the other movie I have done uh, so far, with a different style, with a different approach. It's something that I was not sure to be able to do. But maybe after uh, 10 movies uh, and after 20 years of, of, uh, um, that I spent making movies, I thought, okay, I, maybe I can face something of different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to continue on that difference that you have mentioned. This is a very authentic, very real feeling movie um, that's perhaps in contrast to some of the other heightened things that you've done in the past. And to my eyes, at least, there are always two types of period movies. The ones that looks like there are movies fashioned to look like the era. And there are movies that look like someone actually traveled back in time to that era and shot it in the actual era. And The Hand of God, to me, belongs in that second category. It's such a lived and real feeling period movie. So um, I guess let's talk about your process in fashioning that and how you work with your DP in establishing this authenticity. Okay. Uh, Lydia, Come hai fatto a creare un mondo degli anni Ottanta che sembra davvero autentico, non sembra una ricostruzione uh, degli anni Ottanta? Uh, <coughs> I, I simply followed my memories and um, I think uh, I am lucky because I had a very um, strong and clear memory of my 
teenage uh, teenage so um, I, I followed my memories uh, um, and everything uh, is in the movie uh, belongs to my memory of that uh, moment um, that's it yeah this is the, yeah and it's obviously very collaborative, um, especially when you're doing a period movie from production design element to costuming and also the way with your cinematographer as well. Could you talk about these collaborations a little bit because you're tapping into memory and then you are you have to transcribe that memory to your artisans that you're collaborating with to give us this authentic time and, sen- time, time and place feel. Yeah, the collaboration is uh, based on um, a very simple principle. Because the 80s were, uh, uh, was a decade in our country, um, very invasive from the point of view of the colors, of the way the people uh, uh, was used to, to dress up. Um, um, and uh, it's something that belongs in, in a very clear uh, way to the 80s. I asked the, to the production designer, to the costume designer, to the cinematographer to do a step back and uh, to, um, to remove uh, the strong colors, the, um, the, a, a sort of a vulgarity that belonged to the, to the 80s. Otherwise, uh, the focus of the movie was on that stuff. And uh, instead, uh, my intention was uh, to be focused on the um, on the feelings uh, of the characters uh, and of, on the joy and the pain of the characters. So, uh, the light uh, and the the background uh, is very simple, sober, and um, yes, it, it's 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 something of a little bit different from the from the from the what we are used to see in the movies, in the period of movies about the 80s. I'm so glad you mentioned that because the cliche 80s is so overdone with the big shoulders and ex- extremely vulgar colors that you mentioned, but this is definitely a departure from that. It's the 80s I remember too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I Yes, also because that kind of movies become old very soon. So uh, my intention, of course, like every filmmaker, is uh, to uh, to do a movie that can last in the years. In order to do this, uh, um, it was important that this period of movie uh, looked like a movie that can be set in uh, in um, in the past, of course, because the culture is different, but uh, without being uh, so focused on the um, 80s. It can be in the 70s or in the 60s, uh, it, it, it could be the same, yeah. This is perhaps one of the cliche things that people say when they talk about a movie. The location is almost like another character, but in, in this case, it really is a character, um, Naples of your childhood, the way you remember it. And one of the aspects that stood out to me most is the relationship people have with the sea, with the water, everything keeps kind of coming back to the water and then the memories that are unfolding around the sea. I'm wondering if you could maybe elaborate on that a little bit, what being by the water, by the sea meant for you and your family. Uh, It's something that um, depends on my city. My city has a very tight relationship with the sea. Um, And... uh, Compared to other uh, cities on the sea, Naples is a city where the people go to the sea very often. They go to swim uh, during the day. It's very easy to see uh, people in the, in the bath suite, uh, in a bar or in a restaurant. It's some, there is a, a sort of, um, of uh, promiscuity, can I say promiscuity? Mm-hmm. promiscuity, between the sea and the, the city. Uh, that in other cities uh, does not happen, like uh, New York or Barcelona. In other cities, uh, the sea is uh, something that belongs to the to the port, to the boats. It's something of big that also is a little bit uh, scaring. Um, in Naples, it's exactly the opposite. The sea is uh, is uh, comfortable, is warm because it's a, a gulf, very calm, but where the the, the 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 water is calm. So. Um, we have a, a strong relationship with the sea, and it's impossible to do a movie about Naples without uh, having a, a look uh, at the sea. Yeah. And that, as you said, reflects on the behavior of people too, that looseness of, you know, like you mentioned, walking into a bar, having a bathing suit underneath, 
there is definitely that you, the looseness that you feel in the people's performances because of that comfort. Yeah, what, what's the looseness, uh, Lilia? Uh, rilassamento. Yes, yes, it's, it's, um, it's a slow city, uh, Naples. It's a city where um, uh, you have always the feeling to, that you are spending a holiday. Um, this is also the reason why many Napolitan people that have ambitions, uh, that want to do something in life, live from Naples. Because in Naples, you have always the feeling that uh, um, nothing is really happening. It's just a long, long holiday that lasts all the life. Yeah. Let's talk about your wonderful lead actor, Filippo Scotti, who is a stand-in for you in the movie. I'm wondering what it goes to casting your younger self. What were you looking for in the actor who was going to play you or a version of you? I was uh, looking for uh, an actor, a good actor, first of all, that was able to, to communicate um, the shyness at, and that um, capacity to observe uh, the world that probably belong uh, to me, uh, given the work, the, the job that then I did, that it, it's a job, the filmmaker, based on the capacity to observe the things. And uh, yes, and also uh, uh, um, the fact that uh, he, Filippo, is uh, always not comfortable with the things, with the life, with the world. He's a shy, he's a shy at, and at the same time, uh, he uh, as a, I have the feeling that, that he would love to be in another place, that it's exactly the feeling that I have all the time, and above all, when I was young, that wherever I was, I had the desire to be in another place. And so I found in him all these things. I mean, you definitely sense that undercurrent of wistfulness in his performance. So I'm wondering, you know, you were tapping into your memories and bringing this movie to life. What kind of specifics did you give him to work with? Or maybe another way of asking it is how much freedom did he have to create his own Fabietto? Um, what can I say? No, the... the, 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 the... The script was um, pretty precise about the character, so he followed that. But of course, uh, I didn't ask him to imitate me, or even because it's impossible, because he has not reference. He had in front of him a man of 50 years old that's completely different from the uh, teenager that I was. So he was uh, free in the measure uh, that he was... Uh, uh, free to elaborate a character uh, starting from the script. And, you know, I want to ask a similar question about the wonderful actors who play your parents, um, Tony Servillo and Teresa Saponangelo. You no, know, of course, you know them. And with Tony Servillo, we've seen your collaborations. How, how did you work with them to bring your parents into life? What was your process like? I, I, I didn't say many things, but um, in the small details, scene by scene, uh, I gave indications of following my memories about my mother and, and uh, my father. Mm. Then uh, the actress that play my mother has um, as, as, as some characteristics very similar to my mother. She's always full of joy. She has a great optimism and enthusiasm for the life. And it was something that my father, my mother had as well. So they, it was, it was pretty easy. Um, and Tony Silvillo as well. Uh, uh, we come from similar families with similar parents. So we, we didn't need to talk too much. It's something that we have in our uh, DNA, mm -hmm. um, that kind of... Uh, of the parents, so, or, 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 or for 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 uh, gen generational reasons, we we had uh, similar fathers, me and Tom. Yeah. Can I just say one of the scenes in this movie is not only my favorite scene in the movie, but one of my favorite scenes in all of the movies that I've seen last year. <laughs> the, the one that your 
mom plays a prank about Franco Zeffirelli, you know, wanting to cast the neighbor. Was that story based on a real thing that happened? And how much dramatization did you bring to that? It has such a great sense of humor. I really think about that uh, prank is absolutely real. It happened <laughs> exactly like I, I put on the, in the movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. I mean, I, I just love how, you know, how much closeness you must have with a person that you feel free to play that prank and like, oh, okay, it was a prank. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, it's absolutely free. It was uh, something uh, very, very common uh, in uh, when I was younger in, in family, N not only in my family, but uh, uh, among the, the friends of my father and of my mother to, to make prank was something that was very, very common. Maybe because uh, there was not... Uh, so many forms of destruction like today and so the life was uh, more uh, simple and uh, the prank was uh, a possibility to to go out of the simplicity of the life yeah you have to be inventive to create your own entertainment sometimes sorry no, uh, you have to be creative to create your own entertainment <laughs> yeah yes 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 absolutely absolutely <laughs> Um, uh, my way to, to do movies, it's a sort of uh, to, to, to replicate the pranks that my mother did. Sure. Oh, I love that. Um, and I want to kind of continue on that theme of closeness because family life, the family dynamics um, and how close and intimate everyone with, is with each other is very central to this movie. I am wondering if within your ensemble, how have you established that so sense of really believable chemistry? Was it, did it all come from the script or did you do any rehearsals to kind of create that rapport? I was wondering what your process was in that. No, it was something that came in a very natural way without doing a rehearsal because of the actors uh, I had, because they are all actors from, uh, from Naples, they know each other very well. In, over the years, they worked together in other movies or in uh, theater. So they are a family themselves. They are a sort of large family themselves. Um, and so it was uh, pretty easy to, to make that kind of scenes. It was just uh, the, the only problem maybe sometimes was a sort of a competition among the different actors to do more, to do better to make laugh more than others. In that case, you have to say, okay, let's let's slow down. Otherwise, um, it was something that, that happened in a very natural way, even because there was, uh, above all in the scenes, for example, of the lunch, of the summer lunch in the, in the countryside. It was something, we, we were all, all of us were very excited about the fact that it was a summer, the pandemic was a little bit disappearing, there was a sort of, of um, yes, of excited uh, uh, mood uh, that uh, circulated uh, uh, in, in everybody. Yeah. That exuberance definitely comes through on the screen. And, you know, speaking of that joy and family life that you captured, there is obviously a very delicate balancing in this movie. You know, it's an innocent time, it's a joyous time, but then tragedy strikes and there is a tonal shift in the movie. I am wondering how you were playing with those two extremes while you were writing the script, making sure that they both have a place and not overpowering each other, if that makes sense. I, I worked in, I don't know, it, 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 it was very clear to me that the movie was split in two parts. Um, the first part was a, a sort of a portrait of joy and happiness uh, and um, where the life uh, uh, happens without thoughts, without, uh, without thinking uh, to the serious things of the life. And then, uh, like, uh, some time happened, the life changes uh, completely and... Uh, and uh, the tragedy arrives, and that was my my case. So um, I don't know how, how, how I worked. I simply faced the the scenes. Then uh, the work on the set is uh, is is work. Right. I don't know how to say. Um, you you have to to, to solve uh, many small uh, daily problems and. Uh, 
and you are lucky if at the end there is an emotion in a scene. I'm wondering if we can talk about the the deep love of cinema that's just so integral to this movie. You know, obviously there is the references to Fellini and Bertolucci and especially Capuano, who I believe is a real life mentor for you. Could you talk about um, kind of fusing your movie with that love and how maybe your relationship with Capuano evolved through your childhood to this day? Yeah, the movie when I was younger, like I say in the in the in this movie, where the the chance for me to 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 escape from the reality, the reality was uh, very uh, tiring and heavy, and uh, movies uh, were a great great uh, chance to 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 escape. And because uh, it's not possible to spend all the life uh, watching the movies, I thought, okay, if I want keep on escaping from the reality, I should try to do movies so I can uh, spend all my life uh, uh, around this form of destruction from the real life. And uh, step by step, uh, I started to write and then I met Capuano and I was very lucky because uh, uh, it was, uh, how do you say, colpo di fulmine, Lilia? Come si dice? E coup de foudre. Huh? Could the food? <laughs> it was love at first sight. Yeah, we, we loved each other in a few minutes, uh, and uh, he proposed to me to write, and uh, it was a wonderful relationship relationship that lasts uh, so far. Um, it's a friendship, and uh, it's a, it's a great relationship based uh, on the fact uh, that. Um, we disagree each other all the time and uh, this is not a problem this is something that stimulates uh, me and him uh, to do better things in our work i love the scene between fabietto and capuano that you shot in this kind of beautiful sunken den almost i mean i, I guess a two-part question how did you find that location and how did you decide to shoot it there and the other thing is, did that conversation, did you pull it from real life or were you dramatizing on it? Because what you take away from it about how he should handle his grief from that point on is a big lesson for everybody to learn. Uh, the location, excuse me, Lila, dici, dici un attimo. La no, no, la, de, um... Se era, c'era davvero quella grotta oppure se l'hai sì. inventata e poi che tutto quel discorso sembra proprio una lezione di vita okay. molto importante, è successo o no? Yeah, yeah, the, the location is uh, something that I found out uh, because Naples is a very hard city to find a location from the location on the sea going uh, by car because it's full of... Uh, of rocks so mm-hmm. i found out that location uh, uh, with uh, a boat uh, going very uh, slowly uh, rock after rock a cave after cave and i found out that uh, location in uh, in a building uh, and it was a sort of uh, of, uh, of a gift that when we found out that location the conversation with the Capuano is something that, of course, in real life did not happen in one night. It's mm-hmm. something that happened over the years. Uh, and I put together all the important things uh, he said to me, even the things that uh, are in contradiction with other things that he, say, he says in the same... Uh, because Capuano changes his mind continuously, so it's it's impossible to be to be attached to something that he says uh, the day after he's ready to say the opposite. But uh, how can I say, uh, fishing in all this uh, uh, sea of words that uh, he uses, I found a lesson that he gave to me. And the lesson is uh, is uh, because one thing is very strong in his uh, in his uh, person, in his life, uh, that I learned is is, is unbelievable, uh, vitalistic. He's always uh, able to be to be in touch with life. If mm-hmm. if uh, he's uh, tired, he does not go to sleep, but he goes uh, to swim. Uh, so it's something that uh, I always imbibe to him. 
Andy. Um, and uh, it's something that uh, that uh, something that was very important for me when I meet when I met him because I was uh, pretty depressed. Right. And um, did he see the movie? I'm wondering what what he said. I I don't know. He didn't. I, I don't know. He never told me if he watched the movie or not. I asked him, but he said, no, I don't know. Maybe I have seen he is mysterious about the fact that he has seen or not the movie. Another location that I want to talk to you about, because it's almost like a departure from the film sense of realism happens earlier in the movie when and Patricia follows, you know, this little monk and there is this amazing monastery and this broken chandelier. Can you talk about... Um, you know, that location and the design process that went into that because it's just so unforgettably beautiful. It, it, it was an idea that I had in the script too. I don't know, it was a sort of image that I had in my mind, that this, uh, uh, this old uh, uh, broken uh, building uh, and to put at the beginning, uh, at the center of this, uh, this big room, uh, a chandelier, like it was uh, fold uh, down from the ceiling and uh, nothing and we it, it was not easy to find the location because uh, of course that kind of old buildings are in good conditions because uh, because of course the, the government the, the, the state uh, they, 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 they keep in good conditions that kind of location so we went uh, we, we found uh, that location pretty far outside of Naples it was uh, a building that was uh, forgotten by the, the owners. Yeah. I, I love that character so much, pa Patricia. I'm wondering if she is based on a real person or if she is a composite of some women that you knew in the past. She's almost like this idol, both you know, pure and sexual at the same time in the eyes of Fabietto. So talk, maybe talk about creating her. Yeah, she's she's a she's a mix between my real uh, haunt. It was the haunt of my mother uh, that was used to see ghosts, uh, little man. She and she was not able uh, in her life to have um, uh, kids, to have uh, children, children. But then, then he, she she had, and, and it was a mix between among my aunt and. Uh, other women like uh, uh, very obvious stuff uh, when you are young, the, the friends of your sister, the friends of your brother. Uh, and so it was, a, yes, a compilation of, the, of several women that uh, I loved uh, secretly when I was uh, 16 years old. And it's just so exuberant to see that kind of, you know, passion and desire and almost like worshipping, you know, on, on screen. And it's a big tradition of coming of age movies as well. And um, I'm wondering if you had your favorite coming of age movies that you were thinking about while making The Hand of God or if you had some that are close to your heart within that genre. I, I, for, for, in order to do the movie, I didn't see coming of age movies otherwise I was afraid to be influenced by the movie but of course I have uh, coming of age movies uh, favorites in the over the years and uh, stand um, stand by me of uh, Rob Ryan is a movie that I loved uh, enormously when I was young and uh, another movie that uh, I loved when I was young I, I don't see since many years but I would love to see again is uh, reward les enfants the of Louis Mal. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's a great uh, movie of coming of age, uh, even because it's, it's, it's during the war, it's set during the war. So it's, it's, it, these two movies are uh, two references for me. Yeah. Did Filippo Scotti have any assignments to watch any of them? I, I particularly asked this question because I remember um, when you were talking about them in Telluride, you referred to him as um, the Italian Timothy Chalamet, and I, I never <laughs> forgot that reference. I was kidding, I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I couldn't help but watch him with those eyes a little bit and obviously talk, think about Call Me By Your Name on the side as well. But um, 
it's just something that I remembered. The other thing I want to talk about the movie is obviously the love of soccer, or maybe we should call it football in this conversation. Um, I don't necessarily want to bring myself into it, but I'm Turkish. I grew up in a Mediterranean town and I remember the exuberance of when somebody scored the goal, everybody rushed to the balconies, there was dancing in the streets. It almost had the same power of cinema to bring people together around that shared sense of passion. Um, what did it mean for you to be a football fan back then or even now if your relationship with the sport is still the same? I too was a very, the, the football was very important on many le levels levels because um, because uh, oh, it's, it's a passion it's something that um, that helps me to relax uh, watching uh, football uh, matches is something that helps me to to go out of my mind and so I can uh, I can recharge my batteries. And um, and then uh, in particular Maradona when when he arrived to, to Naples and I started to go to the stadium all the Sundays to see the football matches it was a, it was a real uh, it, it was something that goes over the uh, behind the, the sport it was a sort of art mm, he was an artist in fact. Uh, the, the, there was not uh, there isn't a good movie about Maradona because there are not it's, it's very hard to do good movies about artists mm -hmm. uh, and because Maradona is an artist he's an artist in, in, in the football he's an artist in the in his own life uh, and uh, yes it was, he was because I grew up in a, in an house where uh, there there was not uh, books or uh, the, the, the habit to go to the cinema. So it was my first relationship with the heart, Maradona. My first, uh, uh, yes, relationship with something that was uh, emotional and uh, electric. It was like a shock. And um, perhaps as a closing question, I, I want to know what it means for you now having made this movie. It's a movie about grief and particularly you making sense of that grief, dealing with it. Um, how, how did you evolve both as an artist and maybe as a person after having made Hand of God something so deeply personal for you? I, I, I really don't know. I, I am not able to answer to this question because uh... I don't love to look back at the movies I ever done. As soon as I finish a movie, for me, the only reason uh, to live is the next movie and not the previous movies I ever done. So um, I don't know what means this movie for me, like I don't know what uh, mean all the movies I ever done. I just know that I, I did uh, that movies, uh, that movie uh, that, that I did all my movies uh, just because uh, that precise moment of my life I was interested in uh, in, uh, in a character mm -hmm. for several reasons because it was funny, because it was sad because it was uh, uh, far from me or like in uh, the hand of God because he was very close to me but uh, I choose uh, characters that uh, I would love to put on the stage and I do the movie but um, I really don't know what it means a movie that I ever done for me. Yeah. Um, so maybe to perhaps end it on a fun note, you know, it's a very exuberant cast and clearly they had great chemistry that we talked about. I'm wondering if you remember any anecdotes from the set days, something funny or spontaneous that happened between the cast members when you were shooting the family scenes. Uh... No, I remember when we shot uh, the scene with all the family in the to the sea in the boat. Uh, the 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 sea was uh, agitated. How the community rough, shot. rough. It was rough, and uh, everything happened. Uh, the some uh, many actors started to throw up. To throw up, but a few minutes later uh, they had to do the scenes where they dive in the water so the, the water was dirty it was, <laughs> it was uh, 
it was funny and tragic and uh, an horror movie at the same time, everything, yeah. It kind of goes with the themes of the movie. Paolo, thank you so much for yeah. sharing this and having this conversation with us. And everyone, thank you for joining this special 92Y Talks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.